It's only entertainment. Welcome back to the Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we got George Jage, CEO of Jage Media and producers of MJ Unpacked. George, thanks for being with us at the, at the Talking Hedge. Josh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, George, you founded, uh, you're the former president of MJ Business Daily, MJ BizCon, uh, previous CEO of Dope Media, um, and then you launched Jage Media earlier this year, uh, or excuse me, in 2020, September, I believe. Um, you had a veteran team, cannabis investors, including BDS Analytics, Canopy Boulder, Panther Opportunity Fund, who I find uh, interesting because they just pop up out of nowhere, those guys at Panther, um, and many other cannabis industry veterans. But what drove you to start Jage Media? So uh, actually, we started this in, in September of 2019. Um, we... Um, you know, when I was running MJ BizCon and, and took over and they were a small kind of startup publication in the space. And, you know, there was kind of this idea that cannabis was really going to be legal finally once and for all. Um, you know, it was really a great opportunity. And, and really from that 2014 to 2017 period that I ran that company and scaled them up into a thousand plus booth show at uh, the Las Vegas Convention Center. You know, the industry needed, um, you know, software, they needed equipment, they needed uh, technology. They needed the machine in the corner that goes bing, as I like to say, uh, for those Monty Python fans out there. Um, and, you know, really it was about how do we get the tools and technologies to stand up these licensed operators? But what I also knew is that that was far from being the end game, right? That the end game in our industry were a consumer packaged goods industry. And in every single consumer packaged goods industry, the biggest and most important trade event is built around brands and retailers. And the only reason that we don't have a national CPG show for the cannabis industry is because we don't have a national CPG market yet, but we're going to. So, you know, I always believed that this show existed in the future. Um, it was just a question of who was going to steward and manifest it. Uh, so we started the business based on the idea that we could kind of, you know, play to where the puck was going and actually do a series of state focused events exclusively for cannabis brand and retail executives. And that's always been kind of one of the challenges of this industry is that because it's so new, you don't know who's in the industry, who's legitimately, you know, operating the space. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of shows go to early stage markets where it's like $20 for somebody to get in. And it's just the can of curious come out of the woodworks. And you know, there's a very low return on objectives to events like that or events that are even large that are kind of pan industry approach where it's everybody and anybody who wants to come in, um, into the space. So we, we really felt that there was a much higher, you know, value proposition to kind of creating an event exclusively for what we consider the vanguard of our industry, right? Um, these licensed operators, it's the retail operators that are creating the experience for, you know, consumers to come in and, and, and shop cannabis products and the brands to be able to create the trust and transparency and the product safety and efficacy um, to engage them in the category and, and the cultivators too. Obviously, once you put a label on that, that flower and put it in a jar, it's a consumer packaged goods, but even upstream, the, the cultivators that are providing, you know, the bulk materials that eventually get turned into edibles or consumables in some, some way, shape or form, you know, all part of that ecosystem, but they're the ones on the front line that are winning over the consumers in our market. They're the ones that are going to make our industry grow. And uh, we see them as the most important sub-segment of the industry. And um, yeah, so we, uh, we started the company with that intention and raised a bunch of money in February of 2020. And um, guess what? <laughs> Events got canceled in March. Um, so I want to, I want to get to the capital raise. I also want to get to the pandemic and how that shifted everything. Um, but it is interesting to see you, you kind of readdressing trade shows because for a while there we saw um you know og trade shows like canacon turn into dirt shows where it was mostly fertilizer pick shovels buckets uh and then the general public walking around going oh this is great i get all this free fertilizer and it's the rest of us in the industry are going what what is this shit show what what happened to a, a good trade show um, you have 28 years of trade show leadership experience. You were named trade show elite by trade show executive and also named next generation of leaders by trade show week magazine. George, what's the secret to having so many previous events recognized as a fastest growing show in the U S 
You know, um, I, I think one of the things I've just been very fortunate that I have been able to be in that leadership position for some very early stage events. Um, I'm, I, you know, the first one, um, you know, getting out of college and, you know, my dad's business needed some help. He was a uh, apparel liquidator. They call them jobbers in the space where they would liquidate end of season goods, distressed assets. And he was having some challenges, but we also um, lost the space that we had in Las Vegas that was kind of on the fringe of the big manufacturer show. So we created a trade show for the off-price apparel community. And, um, you know, that's really where I fell in love with the opportunity to kind of, you know, create these events, create this excitement, but really drive transactional success for these companies. Um, and, and moving forward through, through my career, it's just, um, you know, working in those early stage markets, but also really being embedded and really taking the time to understand and listen to those markets. Um, when we launched World Tea Expo, I didn't know anything about tea, but I learned it. And I wasn't trying to do a show for tea. And then next week I'm doing a show, show for, you know, apparel. And the week after that, I'm doing one for bolts and fasteners, right? So some of the big trade show conglomerates, they kind of create these cookie cutter models saying, okay, partner with the association, send out a bunch of emails and they'll show up and sell booze space, right? Like, like when we ran the World Tea Expo, um, you know, I, I, we created the first ever uh, tea auction on U.S. soil and got the Guinness Book of World Records for the price paid for a chest of black tea. Um, I was the first person to bring somebody from the Urusenki Foundation, a grand master from the Urusenki Foundation, to do a Japanese tea ceremony in the United States. So mm -hmm. we look at ways that like can really create like cool engagements. We created this whole um, uh, tea, uh, tea and beverage competition where people were making alcohol infused tea libations. I was a judge for that competition, which was uh, a little bit harrowing <laughs> um, uh, later in the day. But, um, you know, it's just really trying to find, you know, where are those sweet spots where you can do something that people wouldn't think of or haven't seen before or it can really inspire and excite an audience and stay focused to that community. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about a customer experience, whether it's a restaurant or an event, people aren't gonna necessarily uh, go back unless there's that, that experience, right? And so uh, I've lived in Japan and, and the whole coffee and tea making experience is a ritual. Um, and so kind of um, like, cannabis in a, in a way maybe like if someone saw a dabber they'd be like well that is that is one interesting ritual uh, but i think it's the customer experience that's going to bring people back uh time and time again um you ended up launching the first mj unpack summit on june 5th 2020 in downtown denver didn't we actually planned on launching that first one in denver Oh, um, when the pandemic when the pandemic hit, we um, we probably dug up an old press release that we sent out saying that we were launching it. And yep. um, but, you know, we were faced with a situation, you know, in March that like events are going to be canceled indefinitely. And we didn't really understand the full kind of impacts of the pandemic at that time and, and how long it was going to be and how painful it was going to be economically. Um, but, you know, the, the great part about kind of being the dumbest guy to raise money for an events company right before a pandemic is that we didn't lose 90 to 100 percent of our mm. revenues from last year i didn't have to because i didn't have any i didn't have to go back to my customers and say you know i'm keeping your money um, because we can't afford to give it back mm. i didn't have to you know unpack um, you know contracts with vendors and everything else we immediately shifted and said how can we be of service and so we actually launched the very first trade uh, virtual trade show for the cannabis industry in may of 2020 for the colorado markets kind of aligned with what we were planning on doing with the live event um, and, and, and I think it was fantastic. I mean, you know, virtual events in, as a whole were very difficult. Um, there was, it's hard to try to replace the value of face-to-face -face interactions in a digital screen. And it was certainly the weirdest moment of my trade show career. Like we opened that show up, the, the day it's open, I'm like, all right, open the doors. And you see people coming in the room, but I'm sitting in my, my office by myself in total silence. Mm -hmm. And like going, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to behave. Like I'm used to like the doors open. There's this big fanfare excitement. Everybody's looking around, wants to go, you know, find out where they need to go. Um, the conversations are starting. Um, you see people doing business together. Uh, I see friends hugging each other. And it's like, I'm in this room by myself mm -hmm. <laughs> in silence. Mm -hmm. um, it was creepy. And, and so anyways, um, we did three virtual events last year. We did one for the California market. We pushed that back a little bit with some of the looting that happened in California um, mm. that affected a lot of retailers. Um, and then we did one for the Midwest markets, trying to kind of bring 
together the Michigan, Illinois, Missouri uh, markets, and, and, and even Oklahoma. Um, we learned a lot. We engaged with a lot of people. We, I think we provided a lot of value at a time when people were just desperately trying to connect with other people. Um, but I'm glad that that's over. Well, what was it like, though? I mean, walk me through how you were able to kind of successfully pivot to stay relevant. You tried to open uh, and launch an event. Um, but I mean, you did essentially launch your company and the event, whether it was in person or not. And you had a publishing arm and you did it all during the pandemic. Right. Like, How did you manage to pivot to stay relevant? Yeah. Um, so when we when we started looking at like, how are we going to do a digital, you know, a virtual event? And, and listen, I've been in the trade show industry in, you know, for a long time. And I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when virtual trade shows came around and there was a lot of people in the trade show industry going, the sky is falling. We're never going to be in business again. Um, this is going to disrupt our industry, which it didn't. Um, you got to kind of look at the basal you know, need for human interaction. We're animals and it's, it's in our DNA that we need to be around other people in a social environment. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, we looked at a lot of different opportunities out there. What I, what I realized is what are we good at is really building those connections, those relationships. I found a great partner um, that was able to create this. They already did virtual events um, for other industries in the medical community. And we were able to take their technology and their team without having to, you know, scale up and, and you know, double our staff to do an event that was going to, you know, do 10% of the projected revenue of a normal event. Um, and so everybody that came on board, we created these booths for them where they can completely customize them. So they could take a picture of themselves with their smartphone and we could actually create that as an avatar in their booth. So that, that person would be standing in their booth, right? Like we wanted to really personalize the experience but they could take pictures of their products and we could put those products in the booth. And then you could flip around and you could walk to the booth. They have videos that they could play from their booths. So you could click a little TV screen and kind of move around the space. Um, you know, but it was kind of a hard, and then there was a whole chat functionality. Like you could look at everybody that was in the room, you could see their, their, their name, you could click on it and start a conversation with them. Um, and there were people I was talking to that was like, I've got 14 conversations going on with, you know, 15 different people right now. And they were having a blast. Mm -hmm. But once that novelty of that wears off, you know, people get distracted when they're sitting at home. Their dog needs to go for a walk. It's, you know, their kids got to get picked up from school. Um, their boss is emailing them. And, and so that, 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 that ability to kind of have a captive audience, like when you go to a convention center, you're there. Um, when you go to a trade show, you're there, you're present. And you're on your computer screen. We are... Um, like societally like have ADD, right? Like George, how much of that is FOMO too? It, like people want to create FOMO by saying, hey, I'm at this event and you're not. With digital, anyone could be there. And so there's not as much sharing or the, maybe the need or want to be there because it's not exclusive. Well, we still made our event exclusive. We still qualify. Well, I'm just talking about in general. In general, when you see on social media, people are posting stuff and saying, hey, I'm at this event. And if sure. I'm just wondering if, if everyone can be there and you don't have that FOMO driving some folks to certain events, maybe that's the behavioral change and why they're not, why you're not getting flooded with tens or hundreds of thousands of attendees is because it's, it's available to anybody. I, I hear what you're saying, but, um, and, and certainly that fear of missing out is, is something that we all kind of have in the back of our brains, but you know, people who market based on the fear of missing out saying that, look who else is going to be here. We always kind of took the approach that we'd rather sell on value, right? Like we mm -hmm. want to create a tremendous value proposition for people that makes it difficult for them to not want to be there. Not like, oh, you're going to miss out. So, you know, I, I just, I'm not a big fan of, of playing on and preying on fear. I mean, we've done that enough in our political environment for the last couple of decades. And in society of, of, you know, playing the fear element. And I just don't think it's good for society or people in general, or even a company to kind of message themselves around that fear. Um, the, um, but going back to like that virtual event experience, I mean, there was companies like Microsoft and Amazon that, you know, went from having a 20,000 person live event to having 250,000 people attend their virtual events. Mm. And, and for those types of products in the technology space, there was probably those hundreds of thousands of people that wouldn't otherwise get on a plane, go to the event in Las Vegas, pay the money, get approved by their corporate corporations to, to incur those travel expenses. They were less supervised. They were at home. They were expected to manage their own time. And they found a lot of value in going to those events. Um, you know, again, cannabis, 
and you kind of this is, gets back to why I love just not trying to be like somebody that's producing a bunch of events randomly for a bunch of industries, but really embed and compassionately drive an industry forward is that, you know, I know that the cannabis industry is very social um, and, and the same way in the tea industry, tea is very, can be very social. It can be very communal in that sense where people sit down and have a tea. It can also be very meditative where people are sitting having a cup of tea to reflect on their thoughts. And cannabis is a lot like that too. Um, you know, people want to, you know, kind of get inside their own head while they're using cannabis. People also want to share that with other people and have a, a, a kind of a group experience with it. What did early cannabis trade shows look like by comparison? You know, I kind of mentioned that some back in the day were dirt shows or shit shows because they didn't add value like you mentioned or the experience that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a lot of pay to play events still. And, and when I go to them, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because if I go to an event and I want to see the secrets of financial raises, capital raises, and they're talking about a credit card advance and a, a family fund uh, family round or um, a convertible note, that's really annoying. So when they're just going to sell spots, that's not adding value. Can you talk to us maybe a little bit about what early trade shows were like by comparison, what you're doing to make your next event unique? Yeah. So when I got into the space in 2014, there was um, two other events in the market. Um, one was Canacon that you mentioned uh, was launched up here in the Seattle area where I live. And, and that first event was literally cement floors with you know, tables, undraped tables, and people just kind of setting up at these tables and kind of walking through. And, you know, word on the street was that the organizer, you know, left the facility owing them 30 grand and, and stiffed them on it, right? Um, the, um, you know, whether that's true or not, that was just what I heard. Um, the, you know, the other one was NCIA had started a show. They had a, a strategic partnership with uh, MMJ Business Daily at that time um, to partner with them in their show. They wanted to kind of move into kind of policy focused events and decided to create a trade show that looked and smelled and tasted a lot like what we were doing. Um, and then the next year there was 10 and the next year there was 30, right? And a lot of these events, like people said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run an event. And it, what frustrated me was I saw all these people come out and say 30,000 people over 500 exhibitors, right? And they've never done a show before. And, and honestly, they never had any experience doing shows for other industries. And you know, it's, it's the frustrating part isn't like watching them fail because they overpromised and underdelivered. was that they're, they're creating an expectation and under delivering on it to people who are going to lose that money from a marketing spend standpoint for the companies that exhibit it. Mm -hmm. And the people who are attending that show are going to devalue the, 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 the benefit of attending a trade event that's professionally and well run. Mm -hmm. um, selling the stage is, is in my opinion, that's, you know, that's like, um, you know, those ad coupon books that you get in the mail, um, you know, it's just all paid advertising, right? Um, and there's not, you know, those usually end up in the garbage um, for a reason. And so, you know, we look at our content, our stage as really kind of our editorial content, and we keep a strict separation of church and state. Um, same way at MJ Biz, um, they've done a good job of that as well. Um, you know, really looking at how they can create the best conference program that delivers the highest value to the audience. And you know, what's unique about our event, because we're a hyper-focused event, um, we're bringing in some of the most amazing uh, executives in our industry. It's executive level only. And when you're at that executive level in that C-suite, people are, tend to be more open and sharing, um, you know, success stories because they're not looking at us as competition. They're looking at it as we are in a collaborative space trying to grow an industry that we're all going to benefit from. So, um, you know, we have a very high level program addressing some of the top pain points uh, for brands and retailers in the space. And we're not trying to cover 42 different topics. And we're not going to have a session on how to open up a dispensary, because if they don't know how to open up a dispensary, they're not qualified to come to our show. MJ Unpacked is going to be in person, exclusive to cannabis CPG brands, retailers, and accredited investors. This is going to be the first cannabis CPG trade event that's designed to both drive commerce and integrate access to capital maybe you can kind of explain at this point how the pandemic changed events for you. How did you kind of adjust or adapt to the pandemic? I think, I think, you know, we looked at the pandemic as an opportunity to kind of take a deep breath and really think through what creates success at an event, right? Like what are the goals? What are the expectations? And I've always approached trade shows kind of with this three pillar approach of return on investment, 
return on objectives and return on experience, right? And so the return on investment needs to be the people who are investing in the show to take an exhibit space or a sponsorship. We need to make sure that we're connecting them with the right people that is going to create that return on investment that they're expecting from their marketing spend. The return on objectives is gonna be for the attendees being able to get the information or meet with the potential partners that they need to at the show. And the return on experience is just obviously creating an event environment that's that's friendly, right? Like we view this as our house. Um, we're inviting you into our home, albeit a temporary facility that we're renting from somebody else, but making sure that you feel like you're, you're that we tr people are treated the same way we want to be treated. Like what are the things we like about shows? What are the things we don't like? We talked to over 300 brand and retail and investor executives in the space. And we asked them, you know, a series of questions about what they liked and didn't like. Um, we asked them, did they go to Las Vegas in 2019? And if so, did they go to MJ BizCon or were they just there in town? More than half said that they didn't go to MJ BizCon. They were just there to schedule other meetings. And about 40% of them said they spent less than an hour on the floor at MJ BizCon because at this point, like they're not looking for light bulbs and label makers. They're looking for, yeah. you know, the ability to sit down and have a conversation with a potential partner or an acquisition target um, or, you know, maybe a strategic licensee in a new state. Um, so we looked in, and really evaluated what are the need sets and, and what is the experience we want to create. So the first thing that we did is, is that we know that people that people do business with people, not companies. So we need to give a lot of space for people to be able to find a corner to sit down and have a conversation. And if the right people are in the room, three out of five people you bump into are somebody you want to have a conversation to instead of trying to find that one out of 500. So we really wanted to kind of, you know, make this about quality, not quantity not about transactional that we want to sell another booth or another registration ticket, but we want to understand what the companies are trying to do at our show and make sure that we are vested in their success path. Um, and so we created this huge lounge area. It's really cool. Um, I've got soft seating throughout it. I've got a, a foosball table that 16 people can play foosball on at the same <laughs> time. I've got a stage where local musicians are coming in. There's going to be a bar set up and, and it will be open at 10 a.m. So if you need a Bloody Mary, we're not going to judge you. It is Las Vegas. Um, I'm still working on getting an oxygen bar in there and possibly even somebody that can do an IV drip because, again, it is Vegas. Um, we have a, a huge kind of area of investor suites um, where like Poseidon and Panther Capital and um, Entourage Effect, Arcadian, Trailhead, Kenny Ventures and some others. Um, are setting up instead of having a suite, you know, at a random hotel and people wasting their time in a cab line and a hotel elevator, they're right there on the show floor. They can go walk out the room and have access to deal flow. And yet they have the privacy that they need to be able to meet with their investors or portfolio companies, or maybe just an individual one-to-one -to, -one to discuss an investment opportunity. Um, we have a money stage. Um, this is more like a, a Benzinga or a Sedoti or a, a, a Roth conference. It's something I created in the cannabis space for another company back in 2019 called MJ Micro. But um, yeah, this is really an opportunity for companies that are looking to do that corporate presentation approach instead of just networking with investors and doing the follow-ups. And, and people are welcome to do both at our event. Um, we got our main stage. And then, you know, when we came to kind of the trade show floor and we, you know, we didn't want to create a trade show floor. Um, you know, we realized that, you know, for me to get a brand to participate and get brands from around the country to participate, we've got brands coming in from Colorado and California and Washington and Oregon and Nevada and Arizona and Missouri and Illinois and Michigan and Massachusetts, all from across the country to be on display the idea of selling um, a $5,000 or $6,000 booth that is a price for a 10 by 10 at all the national shows. And then having to spend just as much, if not more, to build that booth, ship it out there, set it up and store it. We want to create a really easy price point and a low barrier of entry for them. So we created these brand showcases that are, you know, it's a seven foot tower, four shelves, company's logo on all four sides, but we tech enabled them. So there's a QR code on every one of those. So when attendees come to our show, they can scan that QR code. They can download and view the information about the company and the brands. Um, and then they can direct message a brand rep and say, I'm standing in front of your case. I'd really like to talk to you. Or they can schedule time on their calendar and ask to meet with them sometime later during the show. Um, so it creates all of that connectivity and that lead gen that the brand would expect from having a booth, but they don't have to stand in their booth. They can mm -hmm. move around the event. They can go, they can go and hunt for themselves. Um, and so, you know, that's been very well received in the industry. We've got a ton of amazing brands. They love the idea. It's a low lift. It's an easy point of entry for them. And the price points, you know, about the same as it would cost them just to attend some of these national events with the prices they charge.
Yeah, that's a huge value because when you go to something uh, like an MJ BizCon, a national event, you're going to have people at a booth um, and you can't access them. There might not be a business card and that's missed opportunity. So I think that's a, a great um, advantage to offer that where you can just grab that QR code and, and contact them at a later date. Yeah. Well, once you scan that QR code, that brand's going to have the information that you scan their QR code and they can follow up with you too. So it still creates that lead generation for the brands. But you know, what's really exciting about this is it creates really kind of a, a retail discovery experience, um, as I like to say on our show floor. And again, this is the first show ever that will have brands from around the entire country on display in a single location to really see where the innovation is, you know, who's winning, um, uh, you know, what the market's going to look like. Um, and really give some vision to our industry of, of shaping it into a national CPG industry. We have a huge meeting space on the floor. Um, I've got, uh, um, I'm bringing in a gong from China that's uh, uh, called the Flower of Life gong that uses sacred geomet uh, geometry that's got seven concentric circles, which ties in nice with the marijuana leaf mm. um, that people can bang when they get a deal done. Um, bang Chocolate sponsoring the gong. Thanks, Bang. Um, and, you know, we wanted to create kind of this, this very kind of easy, easy touch, you know, opportunity. We do have, you know, traditional booths. We have some larger 20 by 20 booths. They're all turnkey. So the exhibitors really just need to send graphics and who's coming and show up and set up and go to town. And, um, you know, we just have a lot of very kind of exciting things on our show floor that I think people will enjoy the kind of discovery process for. So it's a little bit different of a model. You're trying to make it uh, easier for people to attend while still kind of pricing it the same way. So MJ Pack being October 21st to the 22nd at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas is for like retailers, investors, brands. For retailers, attendees are going to gain specialized insights, have access to capital, collaborate with other retailers across the country. Uh, free for retailers, by the way. So dispensary license holders and their managing partner teams uh, get in for free. But how would you explain this revenue model to investors? The revenue model for our business or, or the event for an investor wanting to come to the show? No, for, uh, for the business. Yeah. So, um, you know, listen, uh, you know, typically on a trade show business, um, you know, the, the kind of average price per square foot for trade show space is around $35 a square foot. Cannabis industry is obviously selling at a, selling a lot of those shows at a premium. Um, and, and typically you'll see somewhere around, you know, 50 to 60% of your revenues come from exhibit space sales. And you'll see, you know, 20, 25% come from sponsorship sales and the balance from attendee registration revenue. Now it depends on the show. Um, you know, certainly different, different shows have a higher registration price. Um, but the old model always used to be is a buyer should come in for free. Um, and you know, we, you know, our, our value proposition is attracting as many of those buyers as possible. We want to make it as easy for them to decide to come as possible, but you know, retailers are, are very difficult business. They have a very difficult business to run. A lot of times they, they have a difficult time picking their head up and looking over the fence to see where the market's going. Um, the opportunity for peer to peer learning, as you said, is, is phenomenal at our event the opportunity to connect with capital and or maybe even an acquisition you know, partner that might want to buy your business. We know that there's some big MSOs out there operating. So from a revenue standpoint and for our business, um, you know, if I'm selling a, a brand showcase. Yeah. So if I set up my exhibit hall floor, I'll probably end up with about a 40 percent utilization of space if I run just typical bowling lane alleys of, of exhibit space throughout this. Right. So. I've got 100,000 square feet. I'm probably going to get 40,000 square feet of, of exhibit space and say I sell that at $40 a square foot, you know, $1.6 million in sales. Um, and that's really the kind of the, the bread and butter of what drives the economic engine for a business like a, a typical trade show. Now, by me offering these brand showcases, my footprint is, you know, basically, you know, two feet by two feet. And I have this brand showcase that, I, that I'm generating $22 for that four square, you know, four square feet of space. So, you know, my yield on my space by having the brand showcases is actually better than a traditional trade show because of the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm optimizing the package that I'm delivering to the customer to buy exactly what they need and not trying to sell them this real estate package of hundred square feet at a block. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moving on to investors, um, talked about retailers. So with MJ Unpacked and in terms of the investors, it's the first CPG trade event that's designed for both 
to drive commerce and integrate access to capital. Where is the appetite for cannabis investing or where have you seen or heard deal flow being concentrated? Yeah, I, I think when, when we were looking at the industry in the, those early years, uh, you know, 2012, maybe to 2018, you know, I think most of the venture capital that was coming into the space um, was set up specifically to invest in cannabis because the mainstream VCs weren't doing it, or they maybe, you know, family office spun off a, a small chunk of its fund to, you know, make investments in the space. But the, 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 the appetite was really for the picks and shovels, like, right, like everybody's like, you don't want to, you don't want to be mining for gold, you want to be selling the guys mining for gold picks and mm -hmm. shovels. But you know, now that we're really starting, I mean, this, this, the momentum we have behind us right now, I mean, alcohol was a $250 billion industry in 2019. And there's no reason that cannabis can't get to that level. And we're, we're at what, 20, 25, maybe 30 billion, depending on, you know, whose data you look at right now. So, I mean, we're still in the very infancy of, of, of this market. And when you look at, at after prohibition, um, uh, alcohol prohibition ended, that was the birthing of some of the greatest generational wealth that mm -hmm. we've probably seen in that generation for the Seagrams and the Bacardis and the Anheuser Busch families, um, you know Jose Cuervo's family, um, you know, et cetera. That that built these empires and these massive, you know, companies that you know some of the wealthiest privately held companies in the world um, in some cases. Um, so we're at the birthing of those companies happening in cannabis. And where I see the smart money going today is actually investing into the licensed operator because of the huge opportunity for valuation growth. Now, Alan Brockstein, good friend of mine who uh, publishes new cannabis ventures, you know, has been talking about that, you know, most of these publicly traded cannabis stocks have been fairly flat, if not depressed since, you know, highs back in February or March. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, it's, that's not based in, in any real factual, you know, basis. I mean, there's no technical or fundamental basis to those, those valuations. So you look, I mean, first of all, if we see this past as your safe banking, that's going to be a huge valuation jump. You're eliminating a significant amount of risk by a cash operated business. You're providing access to traditional banking solutions. So instead of having to raise money for your operating costs, you can actually maybe get lines of credit. We're already starting to see some companies offer those products in the market. They'll be at our show as well. Um, and, and you're going to see a valuation jump. 280E could potentially return 20 or $30 billion in capital in our industry by some estimates. Um, that might take a little while to um, pry the government uh, off of their meaty hooks of grabbing uh, people's money. But, you know, the 280E tax law obviously doesn't allow a federally illegal business to deduct normal business expenses. So they're paying taxes um, on their gross margin, which can result in a 60, 70, maybe even 100% marginal tax rates for these businesses. So that's going to be another huge valuation jump for these companies. If we start seeing interstate commerce packs, which is certainly plausible and precedented in other industries that are heavily regulated, you know, that's going to be another huge valuation jump. Federal legalization is going to be a huge valuation jump for these businesses, which is in reach. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train coming at us anymore. It's actually a path to Providence. Um, and I think the biggest valuation jump that we're going to see in the cannabis industry is the development of a true on-premise market. In alcohol sales, I mentioned that $250 billion, I think it was around 43 or 46% of it was on-premise consumption. So creating products, and, and we're already seeing these products created with this nano emulsification, emulsification you know, uh, delivery system. So the absorption is happening further upstream, not going through your stomach and liver. So you have a quicker uptime and a shorter um, intoxication profile than you would if you took a traditional edible. Um, and, and, and having products like Can or Viv and Oak or other companies that are coming out with these beverage products, I believe that in, in three, maybe two years, I can go to a bar that is a cannabis bar and order a Granddaddy Purple and Coke, or I can go get a Can uh, seltzer um, or, or one of these products. And, and now I can have multiple consumption instances over the course of a night. And if I get too, too intoxicated, guess what? I'm not going to have a hangover in the morning. Like people are becoming more aware of the significant parity between the social and physiological harm of cannabis versus alcohol. Mm -hmm. And if we can kind of get that holy grail of kind of meeting the, the moment, as I always like to say, of offering an experience that has already been embedded in our society for the last 100, 150 years or millennia, for that matter, of going and having you know, libations, um, but have them be, in, you know, have that intoxicant be cannabis and THC, not alcohol, ethanol. There's a lot of opportunities there. I think with that cross-border, Oregon already passed that law. That's going to allow for beverage companies that 
is probably the, the most expensive with the smallest margins. And you're in Seattle and there's not even a, a infused coffee, like a grab and go RTD, a ready to drink coffee. There's K cups, but you know, that's not coffee. Um, so there, <laughs> there needs to be some more opportunities there. 280E, like you mentioned, would allow a lot of these underperforming cannabis companies to really have an increase in their, uh, in their margins by being able to write off that uh, employee uh, expense. So once 280E is, is allowed, bam, off to the races and shameless plug. I just um, wrote an article for Benzinga about the underperformance of cannabis stocks. It's called uh, Sin Stocks uh, or Vice Stocks, a Sin Not to Have in Your Portfolio. And it talks about the shunned stock hypothesis where a lot of investors that are interested in ESG and SRI stay away from cannabis stocks, which causes a, a um, artificial suppression of, of their value. And so once that kind of goes away, those stocks go up. So in times of economic uh, depression, recession, corrections, cannabis stocks do well because they're already underperforming. So they're going to be looking for those asset classes that go up. And so naturally that's, that's going to happen. But you probably know better than I do, but I imagine that cannabis stocks have had a negative beta since day one. Yeah, except for in uh, November with the elections. And then in January, we saw a huge increase. But like you mentioned, um, uh, with Alan Brockstein, uh, they have been negative, there's been a massive uh, retracement, maybe 60% retracement since January. So I think there's some opportunities, especially leading into this asset allocation from September to December, when a lot of these fund managers reallocate their portfolios could mean that, you know, towards the end of the year, beginning of 2022, we see a nice little pop in stocks. We're going, to, we're going to New York with our next MJ Impact in May of 2022. We'll be in the midtown Manhattan area. Um, nice. we are, you know, this is a huge opportunity to, I mean, they, a lot of the institutional investors, I mean, they're paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, big CPG companies, they're sneaking around at the shows, you know, kind of in the shadows. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I think most of us in cannabis have known, like, you know, probably since like the 1960s, Marlboro already had its packaging design and layout for their cannabis cigarettes at some point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we call them joints. Um, but the, um, you know, the opportunity there for, um, you know, these big companies to come in and, and, and roll it out um, is huge. You know, when you talk about the cannabis beverage category, I mean, you look at what space station's doing out in California, but you got to look at that, that huge capital cost, right? Like the amount of equipment and machinery that is required to create a bottling facility, mm -hmm. um, to be able to retool that for all the various products that are coming through as kind of a, a true bottling house. And obviously then the transportation costs on product goes significantly higher um, because of the, the liquid weight. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, I think, you know, going to be a function of interstate commerce and or federal legalization because... The idea of building out these types of bottling facilities in every single state market is going to be a little overwhelming from There's no way. Yeah, yeah Co Coca-Cola doesn't do that. They have their regional facilities, right? It's, there's no way they would be able to copy and paste the, those SOPs and all of the equipment in all the states. It would never happen. Sure. But, you know, what also they do is they, they, they manufacture the syrup, right? And so they manufacture the syrup, syrup as a very highly concentrated product ship the syrup out to those, those kind of endpoint distribution hubs. Mm -hmm. And then they, they rehydrate it and, and reverse dilute it, so to speak, to um, put into the, the packaging at those locations with a shorter transportation hub, right? Yeah, well, let me ask you about preference when it comes to products like beverages. Uh, do brands even matter? So MJ Unpacked, you're also about brands. MJ Unpacked uh, is gonna anticipate 100 THC CPG uh, brands and products plus 2000 retailers. Jage Media also launched MJ Brand Insights in September 2020, uh, dedicated to providing a sharp, substantive, reliable source of industry intel for cannabis brands and retailers. Uh, and you can so much better than I do. And you can accelerate sustainable growth by fostering enlightened peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. But do brands matter, George? Is it still all about the highest THC at the lowest price? Um, well, we've we've done some coverage on that on MJ Brand Insights. I just did a uh, quick hits with BDSA. We talked about the stoner category. I mean, there's there's certainly I think has been this kind of uh, uh, pursuit for the Chardonnay mom or soccer mom or soccer dad, and and kind of creating opportunities to develop products that kind of meet this category of potential future consumers. And I think you know heavily, you know possibly you know fairly significant revenue opportunities, but, you know, the heavier cannabis consumer, which most of the consumers are, are, are consuming, you know, once daily or, you know, at least, you know, three to four times a week, 
you know, their basket size is much higher. And yeah, they are probably in a lot of cases looking for, some are looking for the highest THC product at the lowest cost. Um, again, look at alcohol prohibition. I mean, you know, it was, you know, what was selling out the door the fastest was probably moonshine, right? Uh, but eventually people realized that there was a sophistication to this and that there was quality products and premium products and local products that they might want to shop for. But when you look at brands, um, what's, what's kind of unusual, I think, about the cannabis industry is that the relationship with the consumer almost exclusively lies with the retailer. And there's certainly case studies for this in other markets, like where Whole Foods as a retailer kind of owns a relationship with, the, with their customers, right? And you're coming to Whole Foods based on an experience and a belief that they're going to have higher quality produce and you can see it and you can taste it and you can feel it. And so that, that brand promise gets delivered for Whole Foods as a retail outlet. But, you know, as a CPG industry, much more like alcohol, I mean, we're going to see that relationship live with the products and the brands um, where I'm going to be able to go to a store and I can order a Jack and Coke, or I might want to have a, a, a Georgetown uh, Bodhisattva, which is one of my favorite beers. It's a nice IPA uh, from a local brewery here. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to care which retail location I'm at. I'm going to care what product I'm buying, right? Based on my personal preference. And especially like in the California market, I mean, like the retailers are like the hyper apex predator out there because they can choose from, you know, 20 different gummies that they can carry in their store. So which one of those edible companies and gummy companies are going to do the most for the retailer? Are they going to cross promote them? Are they going to pay slotting fees? That will change. Um, uh, this is a CPG industry, no doubt. What do you think cannabis brands need right now? I mean, right now you could you could be a Larry's Handy Mart in a world of 7-Elevens if you don't have an exit strategy. So for a lot of companies, whether it's a retailer or or a a farmer thinking that you know he's going to be able to to grow uh, millions of dollars growing hemp. Uh, there's a lot of altruism and people not paying themselves, staying in this industry for whatever reason, thinking that they're going to have a legacy when they probably don't have enough capital to even advertise. What do you think cannabis brands need right, right now? I think the biggest thing is, is for them to be able to you know, start building that relationship with the consumer is going to be fair and um, uh, unfettered uh, access to media opportunities, right? Like, I mean, they are so restricted in, and every state's got their own policies, some very draconian, um, but, you know, you know, they're constantly being booted from Instagram and Facebook and, you know, they use those as their primary tools to build a fan following. Um, you know, some states do allow billboards. Um, certainly you see a lot in the, in the Nevada market when, we, when you go there to Las Vegas in October, um, you know, and, and companies like Weed Maps have certainly helped pioneer that space, you know, because they've had the budget to, you know, run billboard advertising campaigns in a lot of state markets. But I think that, you know, television, you know, radio and all these other, other media assets that, that are restricted to cannabis companies promoting their product has created that bias towards the retailer. So, um, and, and I think then also the other thing for the brands need is to be able to have some type of, you know, increase in their serviceable market, um, which is a function of interstate commerce and or federal legalization. And so somebody who is, you know, manufacturing up here in Washington, you know, has a limit on how much they can produce. So they can only sell probably to a kind of a small geographic area before they are, um, you know, kicked out of that, that market. I think that, that, you know, being able to have access to mainstream media um, uh, markets and, um, you know, I, I think it was Acreage did a Super Bowl commercial a few years ago and, you know, they did a great job. They knew that they didn't want to pay the million or $2 million for the spot probably, but what they did is they submitted it just so it get denied and then they could create this whole kind of social media campaign around here's the Super Bowl ad you won't see. Mm -hmm. um, it was fantastic. I thought they did. A, a, it was clever. It was brilliant. It was strategic. It was it was on point. And I'd like to see more of that. Um, I'd like to see people being able to, um, you know, sample at trade shows um, in every state, not just California. I, I think, you know, opportunities for, you know, kind of without sounding sexist, but like, you know, the bars would send the Bud Light girls and, you know, they would, they would be there and be handing out free swag and everything else. Um, you know, cannabis companies, you know, 
should be able to go and do, you know, in-store demos and hand out product samples to qualified, you know, adult use uh, consumers. Or at least and display it. Right now they can't even display it. Right. So that's an issue. I'm going to give you a three-part uh, question here. Um, leave it closer to the end to give you multiple questions. Um, social equity. MJ Unpacked, you, you guys announced a panel addressing social justice in the cannabis industry. So I want to know what have you done to make structural changes for criminal justice? And then a follow-up, when do you anticipate federal legalization? What is that going to do to the industry? Wow, those are two power pack questions. So first of all, like when we did our virtual trade shows, we did a uh, panel discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We thought that that was important and, and everything else. But we also realized that everybody's doing these DEI panels. That's not the solution. What we did is after we did the first one, we said, we're not doing another one. What we're going to do is make sure that we have underrepresented voices in every sec sec section of our, our, of our discussion. So in every panel and, and every place that we can, we want to make sure that the underrepresented voices of our industry have a, have a seat at the table. We're not, we're not trying to create a, you know, oh, this, you know, a highlight the problem. We want to be a part of the solution. So for our event that we're doing in Las Vegas, I've actually got, this is really important to our organization. Um, first of all, I'm, I've got a strategic partnership that we just created with our academy. They are a social equity and BIPOC owned business accelerator out of the San Francisco Bay Area run by Hillary Yu. She's doing a phenomenal job. Um, we've got a, a equity scholarship that we're getting support so that some of the people that have graduated her cohort, and she's taking these companies and these you know, uh, BIPOC owned businesses and saying, here's your dream. I'm going to help you transform your dream into a business plan, into a pitch deck. I'm going to teach you how to talk to investors and I'm going to help you with your go-to-market strategy, right? And, and those are all of the precursor things for them to be able to launch their business successfully. And we fit perfectly on the back end of that train where we can actually connect them with investors and we can actually help them launch their product in the market at our event. So we've got a, a section of our floor plan where our academy has a booth to help engage people and understand what they're doing. And then six of their cohorts are going to have brand showcases on our show floor. And then we have a dedicated hour pitch session on our money stage um, where some of our cohort um, uh, graduates are going to be able to pitch and raise capital, but they'll have access to capital throughout the whole event. Um, MCBA, Minority Cannabis Business Association, which has done a phenomenal job bringing awareness to the issues that need to be fixed. Um, is hosting a um, summit of their own at our event on Wednesday, the day before our event opens. They also have a booth on our show floor that we want to make sure they had in a prominent location. And some of their member companies will be on display next to their booth. Um, the last thing as far as criminal justice reform, and, um, and I just had a chat with Steve D'Angelo yesterday, but mm. you know we're not really going to have a legal industry until we get the people who are incarcerated for cannabis and nonviolent cannabis crimes, selling, distributing. I don't care if it was you know, two grams or 200 pounds, um, you know, it's a plant and nobody was hurt in that transaction and we should get those people out of jail. And Last Prisoner Project has certainly been the one organization that our industry has rallied around. So we've brought in um, the Blues Brothers, the legendary Blues Brothers, Jim uh, Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. They're going to be doing a live benefit concert at the House of Blues at the Mandalay Bay exclusively for the attendees of our event. It's exclusive. Um, it is a separate ticketed event, and we're donating 100% of the net proceeds to Last Prisoner Project. Um, we've got some other things that we're doing, um, auctioning off uh, on our show floor that's directly benefiting Last Prisoner Project. And we're going to be raising money at the benefit event and during our event. My hopes is that we may raise as much as a quarter million dollars for LPP. And, and they're not just, you know, helping with legal fees to get people out of jail. They're helping rehabilitate, you know, their constituents, you know, you know almost all of them need medical care or dental care when they get out of prison. They need money for rent. They need clothes. Um, they need help getting, you know, finding a job or, you know, maybe getting on their feet and starting a business. Um, some of them have been very successful cannabis entrepreneurs post clemency. Um, and they're doing really some amazing hero work. And we're really good at building an event and kind of, you know, kind of the, being the PT Barnum of the circus and bringing everybody together. But I've always, you know, made it a point and a priority for every event that we've done um, to make sure that we have some type of, you know, benefit event or something that we can also do good into the back into the community we're serving because we're not we're not in this for the short haul. Um, you know, if we don't support the community, um, I don't expect them to support us. So um, it's just we see it as a moral obligation. When do you anticipate federal legalization? I kind of ask that, assuming 
that that will kind of change some stuff. Federal banking, one of those things, we kind of talk about SBA loans and uh, social equity. I've been in banking and I never saw SBA help anybody. So anybody anticipating that banking and the safe fact or, or whatever else is going to help people, the highly doubt it. Um, but having said that, what is your anticipation for federal legalization and how do you think that's going to help the industry? Well, I'm going to have to go get my crystal ball here. And Swami says, no, um, you know, I'm hoping that this is something that we're going to see in, in this term, this administration's term. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in the industry. I mean, we are going to have an overwhelming majority of the senators and representatives in our Congress, regardless of party affiliation, that represent states that have legal cannabis, period. Um, so this is the golden hour for us to get this through. Um, it's complicated. I think that a big part of politics, unfortunately, because of Citizens United is driven by corporate donations. And we're starting to see the scaling of some of the bigger players in our industry who have taken their responsibility seriously to help, you know, hopefully move some of this legislation forward. Um, but there's a lot of challenges there, right? Like some of the, some of the big MSOs don't want to see federal legalization because they mm -hmm. want to have that ability to secure exclusive limited licenses in states that they have a competitive advantage of because of their operational efficiencies and their access to capital. Mm -hmm. um, I think on the short side, we're going to see it um, post midterm uh, on the long side. Um, I, I, I hope that it happens during this current administration, because I don't know what's going to happen at, you know, in the 2024 elections. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a scary world out there and I'll leave it at that. It, it is. Um, yeah. My crystal ball prediction is that whoever gets elected, oh, I, I want one of those. Whoever gets elected or reelected, uh, it'll happen right at the beginning of the next term. That's my prediction. Yeah, and, and I, I certainly hope so. Um, well, it will make it easier to raise capital, I think. Who's the Democratic candidate then? Is it Kamala Harris? Kamala yes. Harris? Right. That's my, that's my guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do think it'll make it easier uh, for raising capital. You guys raised capital. I think uh, you raised 750000 in equity and convertible debt back in February 2020. I think you're still currently raising about half a million through a safe uh, with 60% yeah, completed. We that actually, um, we've, Perfect. we've completed our safe round. Um, and that was really just to fill the tank back up. I mean, when we entered into 2020 with our original plans and raised the money on those original plans, we obviously changed them significantly. And the revenue opportunity for virtual events was very small, um, but we saw it as an opportunity to kind of build our relationships, uh, our infrastructure, um, our team. Um, so we really wanted to basically tap off, top off the gas tank and, and listen, I mean, trade shows on scale can be very successful and profitable. Um, you know, we're not in this to kind of, again, for short-term game, we want to be able to create our business success as a function of creating success for our clients, um, not the other way around. And that's going back to some of those other shit shows as you refer to them with is that people say, see an opportunity to, to create an event, sell a booth, sell a ticket, sell a booth, sell a ticket. They don't take the time to understand their audience and how they can create true value they're never going to be successful so you raise capital through a simple agreement for future equity or safe so that was created as a way to replace a convertible note that's just simply an exchange for cash and the investors get the right to purchase stock at a future round what are the uh use of funds uh what are you going to use the funds for and what are the biggest potential drivers for your revenue growth over the next couple of years um, so, you know, the use of funds is, is, is basically for us to, you know, operating capital and sales and marketing to build our show platform, right? Um, we've got events planned out for 2022 and into 2023 now. Um, so we've got to use some of that capital to secure future venues and, and other assets that we need in those future dates. Um, you know, the biggest revenue growth is going to be our, our events. Um, again, on scale, um, without kind of giving away the secret sauce, but, you know, once I cover my basic costs of, you know, staffing, registration and other fixed costs like the venue costs and everything else, my costs become very variable. And so as I sell more booth space, as we sell more registrations, you know, a lot of that money falls to the bottom line um, once we kind of hit our, our minimum threshold. So the margins are really good there. Um, but, you know, we're not trying to be the biggest. We want to be the best right now. And I think once we're the best, it gives us unlimited opportunity to be the biggest. 
Um, so, you know, we see the, the events being the primary, you know, source of revenue growth. Um, you know, I've built a number of, you know, integrated media assets as we, as they're called, you know, where you have print, digital, um, you know, events, events are going to be the ones that you make your money on. Um, the, um, you know, as far as the future growth opportunities, we've got a lot of very unique uh, discussions going on um, and, and the opportunity to kind of transform what we're doing, you know, both as a trade show and saying, how do we make this more viable, more successful? How, how can we take those other related media assets, such as our digital publication, which is a pretty straight block, you know, block and tackle, put up content, sell advertising. We haven't really pushed a lot of the advertising sales on there. We've given some great deals to our clients. Um, it's really about you know creating a, a a place where we can connect with our community on a year round basis. But we've got some really great ideas in the in the hopper right now that we see as huge growth potential, um, you know, uh, uh, to serve the market in a much more robust way and meet the needs of the moment. Little teaser there. We're gonna have to stay tuned. Before we wrap this one up, though, I want to ask you about some acquisition, strategic partnership. Um, so Jage, powerhouse in the cannabis industry, best known for business business growth, specializing in cannabis. Uh, or business builder adept at identifying new markets opportunities to scale national businesses. Prior to founding Jage Media, uh, George was chief executive officer at Dope Media, leading the six-year-old startup to its acquisition by High Times. Can you kind of describe your tenure at Dope Magazine and how you set up your exit strategy that ultimately led to the acquisition by High Times? Yeah, um, that's kind of one of those, those things that's, you know, um, definitely a two-sided coin. Um, so, you know, it was an opportunity after I left MJ BizCon um, that I really want to stay in the cannabis space. I had some uh, legal issues I needed to resolve with the owners over at MJ Biz. So I didn't want to necessarily um, drive right across their bow at the moment. I wanted to look at consumer media opportunities, and I've never really had the chance to build a consumer media asset before. So I was very excited about the challenge. Um, the, the founders over there built an incredibly iconic brand. Um, they had built a, a significant, you know, base of revenue that they were able to kind of manifest on, on an annual basis with great growth. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's a very difficult business model and it was an oversaturated space. You know, you got Mary Jane, you got High Times, you got Dope, you got Civilized, you got, you know, Cannabis Now. And I, I really don't think that there's been many that have been able to really create a successful, profitable consumer mm -hmm media asset in the cannabis space, probably with the exception of cannabis now. Um, but the, um, and Sensi Magazine, there's another one, right? Like there's just a lot of redundancy and competition. And then once you kind of move that down, it's, it's markets because of the lack of federal legalization really kind of hyper-focus on the local market. So you've got Vegas Cannabis Me Magazine, you've got Rooster, you see people advertising the alt weeklies. Um, so you've got all that competition for the advertising dollars to really monetize that business. Um, you know, there was an opportunity and part of, you know, when I came on board at Dope was the idea. And at the time, there was a lot of companies going public on the, on the Canadian Stock Exchange. There was a commitment of capital by a fairly well-known large investment group in Canada that was going to fund um, a, a big chunk of growth for Dope Magazine to expand nationally and for us to go get listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Um, after I took the seat, that, that offer came in and it had a lot of hooks and it really wasn't a good and a good deal for the founders or the investors. And I kind of had to balance the needs of both. Um, as we moved on from that, I needed to raise capital and it was very difficult to raise capital for a business that had not made a dollar profit in its six years of operating you know, success. While it had the revenue growth, it just you know, wasn't going to be able to get over that hump, right? If it hadn't already. Um, we saw an opportunity that there was a number of publicly traded companies that were looking to acquire revenue streams that didn't necessarily have to be profitable. We had a deal done with a publicly traded company that I won't mention um, that at the end hour tried to retrade us. And um, those terms were very egregious mm -hmm. um, and high times it had a strong interest. So, you know, knowing Adam, I went down and met with them and said, if you can do this, this and this, we can sell you Dope magazine. Um, it was really just at the time, the best path forward for the magazine. Um, it was also, you know, contingent dope or high times going public. Um, unfortunately, they've been saying they've been going public for the last four years. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen at this point. But, um, you know, I think it was a great ride. And I think that the founders of Dope Magazine and the employees of Dope Magazine have a tremendous amount to be proud of, of what they created. And not all businesses live forever and not all businesses need to live forever. Um, but they made a very significant, you know, impact in the industry. 
um, uh, helped a lot of businesses and helped create a lot of consumer awareness that wouldn't have otherwise happened had it not been for the kind of grit and the hustle of that, uh, you know, that founding entrepreneurial team. Uh, you've also had strategic partnerships. I think Apex Cannabis Marketplace, one of them. So Jage Media, they formed a strategic partnership with Apex Trading as a preferred wholesale ordering platform of MJ Unpacked. Distribution and, and access to products is critical. I've seen a lot of ex-athletes come in and open up, you know, two dozen stores in Bartels. It's kind of like a Rite Aid, Walgreen equivalent for those in other markets that don't know. Um, so it's not just about having your product there. It's actually about marketing, advertising, distributing, getting access to your products. Very crucial for this industry or any industry rather. Maybe you can describe your partnership with Apex and how you can anticipate utilizing their wholesale cannabis platform. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we have a strategic partnership you mentioned earlier with BDSA, and that was, you know, based on that, you know, launching a new event in the industry. I, I certainly know that I had some reputational equity, but that, that doesn't go very far and it kind of stays in kind of close circles. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the front face of MJ Biz. I was the wizard behind the curtain pulling the levers to kind of really drive the strategy. Um, and, you know, that's a really important partnership for us because it gives us the the, the credibility of having one of the biggest and most successful, you know, marketing data and consumer insights firm behind us. And Apex Trading is the same way, like their ability to provide a, you know, distribution and ordering platform for the wholesalers um, uh, to, you know, be able to reach the retailers is kind of that same sweet spot that we're targeting, right? Of connecting the brands and the retailers together and creating more uh, operational efficiency. They're doing it through technology. We're doing it through live events. So we see an opportunity to really kind of help cross promote each other's businesses to the, the people that we're engaged with. Um, and we certainly are exploring other opportunities to actually bring that technology and that, that live event experience together that can create, you know, really a continuum around the year of the trade show experience and ordering, ordering experience, right? Um, you know, we also recently started a, a partnership, a content partnership with Pioneer Intelligence. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a peek at what they're doing, um, they're, they've created a, a comprehensive um, kind of data engine that looks at uh, consumer engagement through three primary pillars of social media, uh, website, and earned media, and provides a kind of uh, proprietary ranking system to see which brands are trending up and gaining the most consumer awareness in any given market um, across any different category. Um, and it's really fascinating data. And I think that type of stuff and being able to bring those tools together and maybe as we continue to grow, finding ways that we can kind of um, really kind of almost create a, a single stop uh, shop point for brands, for retailers to come in, get the data they need, be able to see the consumer insights they need, see the opportunities for, you know, ordering efficiency they need is certainly, I think, where we hope to go to. We talked about a lot. Is there anything that we left out or where people can find you at? Well, they can uh, certainly encourage you to visit mjbrandinsights.com um, and sign up to get our weekly email newsletter. Um, our managing editor, Felisa Rogers, is truly just an amazing, amazing journalist and um, has done a phenomenal job really kind of, um, you know, honing that content to be on point with our brand message. Uh, www.mjunpacked. I know when I say www, it makes me seem as old as Al Gore. Um, but the, um, you know, we certainly, um, you know, would love to get anybody who is a CPG brand or retail executive with a title of manager or hire to sign up and attend our inaugural event in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Hotel, um, and certainly accredited investors that are actively investing in cannabis space. And we really group that kind of active investors as people who can write a check, right? So, you know, real estate investment trust, they can write a check and provide access to capital to the licensed operators. Um, same thing with some of the new, you know, emerging direct lenders that we see in the space that, you know, build portfolios and are creating lines of credit for some of these operating companies is definitely an improvement to access to capital for our market. All right. That's MJ Unpacked. That's October 21st and 22nd at Mandalay Bay Resort in Las Vegas. Uh, there's going to be Dan Aykroyd, Jim Belushi, uh, Christy Hefner, Hugh Hefner's daughter are going to be keynote speakers. Like we said before, there's over 100 CPG brands, uh, 2,000 retailers. There's going to be 11 conference sessions and panel discussions among industry leaders. There's investor pitches for companies that are seeking capital. You'll have exclusive mixers and for industry professionals. Blues Brothers Conference benefiting uh, LPP that you mentioned for restorative justice and cannabis. All good things uh, to go and, and uh, promote and uh, support. Don't forget, my, don't forget my gong. 
Yes, and the Chinese gong. I might hit that without a deal. I might just have to do it anyways. Listen, it's a natural energy healing gong, so feel free. Yeah, count on it. Um, all right, so I guess with that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, George Jage. He's CEO of Jage Media, producers of MJ Unpacked. George, thanks for being here with us at, C- at uh, the Talking Hedge. Josh, thank you so much. See you in Appreciate Las Vegas. It. Absolutely. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Are you looking for the next great cannabis business to invest in? Then you need to check out the MJ Bulls podcast. Hi, I'm Dan Humiston. Join me each week as I speak to both cannabis entrepreneurs who are raising capital and cannabis investors who are investing capital. Our 10-minute episodes are perfect for the busy investor. Start listening to the MJ Bulls podcast today, wherever you listen to podcasts, and who knows, maybe you'll discover the next cannabis unicorn.